I am Dr. Charlene Senegal de Queer, Associate Professor of History here at Xavier University, and I'm happy to say that, yeah. <laughs> yay. <laughs> All right. We want to thank Dr. Kara Tunica Oldridge and the Amistad Research Center for co-sponsoring today's guest speaker, Isabel Wickerson. The Amistad Research Center is committed to collecting, preserving, and promoting open access to original materials that reference social and cultural importance of Americans' ethnic and racial history, the African diaspora, human relations, and civil rights. Ms. Wickerson's address today is a part of Amistad's Conversations in Color series, which is funded by the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Pulitzer Prize winner and National Humanities Medalist <laughs> Isabel Wickerson is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Warmth of the Other Suns. Wickerson spent 15 years working on warmth, interviewing more than 1,200 people to tell one of the greatest underreported stories of the 20th century, that of the Great Migration. In addition to National Book Critics Circle Award, her book has won the Heartland Prize for Nonfiction, the Ansel Wolf Award for Nonfiction, the Linton History Prize from Harvard and Columbia Universities, the Stephen Ambrose Oral History Prize, and was shortlisted for both the Penn Garboff Literary Award and Dayton Literary Peace Prize. The Warmth of the Other Sun was named to more than 30 best of the year list, including the New York Times 10 best, 10 best books of the year, Amazon's five best books of the year, and the best of the year list for the New Yorker, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post, amongst others. It made national news when President Obama chose the book for summer reading in 2011. In 2012, the New York Times Magazine named Warmth to the list of best nonfiction books for all time. Wickerson won the Pulitzer Prize for her work as Chicago Bureau of the New York Times in 1994, making her the first black woman in the history of American journalism to win a Pulitzer Prize and the first African American woman to win an indi for individual reporting. Please welcome me Please join me in welcoming to the stage Ms. Isabel Wickerson. Good morning and happy birthday. <laughs> I am so pleased and honored to be here in New Orleans. I've been to New Orleans, or I should say the book has been to New Orleans many times since it's been out. Um, as mentioned, I spent 15 years working on this book, so I often say that if this book were a human being, it would be in high school and dating. That's how long it took me to write it. And this is my copy of the book, which has been to New Orleans at least five times and is beginning to show its wear. But I so appreciate being able to be here to celebrate with you. This city uh, and the South in general and Louisiana in particular are central to the story of the Great Migration. Um, it's no accident that the states that from which students coming to Xavier um, are that those states are California and Illinois or Los Angeles and Chicago because those were the receiving stations of the Great Migration from which the ancestors of current day students actually went in search of freedom during the time of the Great Migration. So this is a beautifully circular story. I would like to say that a lot of people refer to it as a reverse migration and I would like to say that I don't use the term reverse migration but because reverse suggests that you're going back Backward. And I don't believe that any migration is a going backward. And I certainly would not say that coming to New Orleans is going backward. I say it's a return migration, which is a beautiful thing. <laughs> So I want to say a little bit clearly and talk about this great migration, which is putatively the, the theme of the work that I've done, uh, the theme of the book, The Warmth of Other Suns. And it would make you think that the great migration is about migration. But I would suggest that no migration is actually about migration. That's actually one of the things that I've learned in the 
in the course of uh, talking about this book over the eight years that it's been out. I mean, it's incredible that it's been out for eight years, and it's kept me on the road nonstop. And so during the course of all of this time, I really discovered what the book was about, what the Great Migration was about, what any migration is actually about. And I've learned that migration is not about geography. Migration is not about moving. It's not about migration, it's actually about freedom and how far people are willing to go to achieve it. That is what every migration that has ever occurred in human history is really truly about, the desire to be free. And that's what connects all these migrations to the stories of the backgrounds of all of us in this room, no matter where our ancestors may have come from, they have all had to have come from a long, long ways away in order to uh, create the family lineages that make us who we are. And that means that you know if your grandparents or great-great-great-grandparents came from, from uh, France or Haiti or, or Ireland or uh, Japan or China or wherever they might have come uh, to get to where we happen to be right now, this is an indication of what humans are willing to do in order to be free. And so that's what migrations are about. So these people in the Great Migration, the Southerners, African-American Southerners who uh, went to different parts of, of the United States during what was called the Great Migration, which was in fact, to d define it, the outpouring of six million American citizens from the Jim Crow South out to all places, North, Midwest, and West. This, this, act this migration was in some ways, the people were proxies for someone in all of our backgrounds who in some place in our family tree had to have done what these people did because we're here as proof of that. But the difference between this migration and and other migrations that have occurred throughout hu human history is that this was the only time in American history that American citizens had to flee the land of their birth just to be recognized as the citizens that they had always been. No other group of Americans has had to act like immigrants in order to be recognized as citizens. And so this migration, this great migration, was in, indeed not a move. It was actually a defection. It was a seeking of political asylum within the borders of one's own country. They were defecting a caste system that's in some ways for us, those of us today who did not grow up with uh, in this world that I'm about to describe to you, it might be hard to imagine the world that they were, were forced to flee, but they were leaving what can only be called a caste system that was so arcane that was actually against the law in Birmingham, for example, for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together. You could go to jail if you were caught playing checkers with a person of a different race. That means that someone must have seen a black person and a white person playing checkers together in some town square, and maybe the wrong person was winning, or maybe they were having too good of a time. But whatever it was that they saw, they felt that the entire foundation of Southern civilization was in peril and took the time to write that down, have that written down as a law in, in uh, Birmingham. <clears throat> This caste system was so extreme and so arcane that in, in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. The very word of God was segregated in the Jim Crow caste system that held everyone in that, in that era in its grip. Now, um, you know, the way that I discovered this idea of, about, I mean, the, the fact that there had been actually segregated Bibles, that the very word of God was segregated, was in the, in the effort to tell this very large story about six million people pouring out of the South. I needed to be able to describe what it was that would, would propel people to do such a thing, to leave this beautiful, beautiful land, this, the wonderful, rich culture of their ancestors, and to set out for places far away, the cold north and the distant west, in order to do this. And so I was looking for examples of what was it like to live in that world. And I, there are no references in the book to water fountains and restrooms because well, we just came out of February, Black History Month, and every second grader will be able to tell you about that now. So why would I, t why would I spend 15 years to tell you what a second grader can tell you after, after February? So this was an effort to try to find other examples that would allow us to see and to feel and to experience what it was like to live in that world and how suffocating it was for really everyone in that world, even the 
putative beneficiaries of it. And so uh, looking through all of the archives and the various newspapers and records of the era, came across this newspaper heading headline that said, that mentioned the Jim Crow Bible. And I wonder, well, what would that be? How would you do that? Why would you do that? So the article ran, actually, this was in, uh, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where the headline was coming from. And it turned out that this, the, it made the news that day, not because they were embarrassed by this law or there's some shocking announcement of the law. The law had been in place for a long time, and they had, they had accepted that. They didn't write about it because it was a new law. In fact, it had been there for some time. This was the 1940s. The only reason it made it in the paper that day was because on that particular day there had been a trial and session and they could not find the black bible and they so in, so they had to suspend the trial until they could find the black bible for the witness to the witness who was about to take the stand to swear to swear to tell the truth whole truth and nothing but the truth to help him god he could not touch the white bible and they decided to suspend the trial and the and the judge ordered the court officers bailiffs and sheriff's deputies to find the black Bible so they could resume the trial. Now, I've since been asked, well, were they different versions of the Bible? You know, maybe the King James version for one group and maybe American Standard for the other group. And it turned out that they were the same version of the Bible, uh, the King James version. It's just that the same sacred object could not be touched by hands of different races. This, uh, it, this entire experience of exploring this era in our country's history, which is necessary for understanding where we are today. This is the DNA of our country, whether we wish to, to, uh, to know it or not. We live with the after effects of the, the, the DNA, almost like a human body is living, you know, we inherit the, the traits and the, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of those who went before us. And so we're living with this, whether we know it or not. And so as I've gone around the, the country and actually outside of the country talking about this, this book has become Become very well traveled. I have always found that my most challenging audiences, bless their hearts, as they say here in the South, <laughs> are my are the high school students. That's because they have such a difficult time, you know, wrapping their heads around the specificity of these laws, the specificity of the world that that was confining everyone in that space. And so I found myself, or the book was invited to, to go to Hawaii, far, far from the origins of the Great Migration, although people did go out to Hawaii as well. But of course, people came from all over the world to be in Hawaii. So I was talking with these students, and I was having a difficult time connecting to them, and I needed to come up with an example from the book to make it come alive for them. So I want to share with you what example really got to the high school students that I was speaking to. But before I tell you what that example was, I'd like to see if I might get a show of hands from anyone here in this, uh, in this auditorium who might have done what I'm about to describe. Now, what I'm about to describe is not against the law. I would never, ever, you know, ask people to raise their hands or such a thing. But I'd like to see, you know, just to think about your daily life and, and, and how you, uh, how you the, the various things that you have to do in the course of a day. I'd like to know how many of you in the last month have found yourself driving your car and you found that you were about to overtake a car that was going more slowly than you were. So you did the wise and safe thing, which would be to pass that slower car on the road. So my question is, how many of you have passed another car in the last month? Yes, I see most hands go up. I see a few hands that did not go up, and I suggest you do not drive. I mean, you, I suggest you don't drive because it's almost impossible to be driving your car and not have to pass somebody in the road. And you, you really do it without thinking. You do it because it's the most natural thing in the world to do. In fact, the car almost does it for you. And we know that the cars will be doing that for us in the very near future because that is what you do to be a safe and wise driver. But had you been African American throughout much of the South, into the 1970s in the isolated precincts of, of rural areas of the South, believe it or not, it was against the law and against protocol for an African-American Amer motorist to pass a white motorist on the road no matter how slowly that person was going. Now, I would suggest that that could account for a couple of million people at least thinking about leaving because it's almost against your natural instincts of being safe. And yet that is what, that was the world that they were in. So I told this to the students in Hawaii 
And uh, they were, you know, 15, 16 years old, which may give you a clue as to their connection to driving. And they absolutely just went nuts. They were not having any of this. And they, I lost control of the classroom at that point. And I, I asked one of the students what it was he was saying in the back. And he said, he said, well, I would have honked. I would have honked to make the go faster. And I, and I said, well, let me start again. If you, if you could not pass the people on the road, you couldn't honk to make them go faster. And they didn't like that either, and they kept talking. And, um, and I, the, another one, I said, well, would you raise your head? Tell me what it is you're saying. And he said, well, I would have tailgated. I wouldn't have made any noise, but I would have tailgated to let them know they needed to go faster. And I said, the, the, remember now, you, you couldn't pass the people on the road. You could, so you couldn't, you couldn't hop to make them go faster. You couldn't pass them, and you couldn't tailgate either. You had to stay in your place. That's what it means to be in a caste system. It was an artificial hierarchy in which everything that everyone in that world could and could not do was based upon what they looked like. And so I said, you couldn't, you couldn't honk, you couldn't tailgate, couldn't pass them. You had to stay in your place. And they didn't like that either. Another one raised his hand. He said, well, I would have left then. I said, well, that is what six million people chose to do rather than to live uh, in a caste system such as that. And what's interesting is that it, to our ears now, it seems so bizarre and so inane, insane, and that it's actually seemingly laughable. But I, I really have to remind all of us, myself as well, that this was deadly serious. In that era, in that day and age, this was a matter and could be a matter of life and death. In fact, uh, it's very well known and it's been documented extremely um, carefully that every four days somewhere in the American South in the decades leading up to the start of the Great Migration, an African American was lynched for some perceived breach of the caste system that I'm describing to you. And, and we all know about the horrific ex uh, example of, of Emmett Till, but the more common reasons for lynching were not those kind of those large, uh, well-known cases of some untoward remark toward a southern white woman, but rather for the little things. There are people who lost their lives in a lynching for the accusation of having stolen 75 cents. There are people who lost their lives in a lynching for having the accusation of having stolen a hog or a mule. And the more common reason, commonly cited uh, pretext for a lynching was for the amorphous, all-encompassing infraction of acting like a white person. And that could mean anything from not stepping off the sidewalk fast enough, not tipping one's hat, uh, walking into the wrong door. So the, this was deadly serious, the, the tremendous effort and, uh, and, uh, and time that was spent to enforce this caste system was, was tremendous. Now, one of the things I want to say just about a caste system in general is that this caste system was in place for many, many reasons, but one of them was economic. And that was because, as we know, the South was dependent upon not just the supply of, leap, of cheap labor, but an oversupply of cheap labor to work at the will of the land. And so that meant that the South required that there be an oversupply, more people than it might be necessary to, to do the chopping and the planting, the chopping and the tending of, of the various uh, you know, cotton and sugar cane and rice and tobacco that were the lifeblood of the South. And so that meant that it was very much economically based. But the Great Migration began. These people began to leave in large numbers for the first time in the, in the history of African Americans on the soil, the many, many centuries leading up to that. They, there's outpouring because during World War I, it was the North that had a problem. The North had a labor shortage because during World War I, it was losing its European immigrants, the immigrants that were working the foundries and the factories and the steel mills of the, of the North. And so the North needed to have labor at the precise moment that it had this labor shortage because to, to help with the war effort, it needed more, more hands on deck. And so what did the North do? The North set out to find the cheapest labor in the land and that meant African Americans in the South, many of whom were not even being paid for their hard work. They were sharecroppers and working for the right to live on the land that they were farming. They were not being paid, uh, or if they were, they were barely clearing whatever they had for the year, and so they were ripe for recruitment. It's very important to recognize that those who, those initial waves of people who left, and I often like to remind Northerners of this, uh, arrived in the North at the express invitation of the North. 
the response to their arrival, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but their response to their arrival has been puzzling on many levels because one would not think that they were, they were not welcomed as they, as they might have been because it turned out that the North wanted the labor but did not want the people. So how do you do that? How do you do that? As, he's, as the North went uh, recruiting uh, African Americans from the South, it turned out that the South did not take kindly to this poaching of its cheap labor and actually did everything it could to keep the people from leaving. They would actually arrest African Americans from the railroad platforms. Remember, these are putatively free American citizens. They would arrest them from their train seats. And when there were too many to arrest, they would wave the train on through so that people who had been hoping and praying and saving to get to the, the chance to go to what they hoped would be freedom had to watch the train leave without them and then figure out how now will we get out. And as they made their way out, it turned out that they were like any migration stream throughout human history, following beautifully predictable streams, as is the case with any migration throughout history. In the north, for example, there are places in, in the north, there's a place called Holland, Michigan, for a reason, because that's where people from the Netherlands migrated. The, you know, the entire state of Minnesota is often known for its large Scandinavian population, and that's for a reason. That's what people do when they migrate. And so this great migration was no different. There were three streams of the migration. One was up the east coast from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, and on up the East Coast. There was the Midwest Stream, which carried people from Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Arkansas, and Tennessee primarily, to Chicago, Cleveland, uh, Minneapolis, uh, the entire Midwest. And then there was the West Coast Stream, which carried people from Louisiana and Texas out to California. And when they really wanted to get away, they went to Seattle. And when they really, really wanted to get away, they went to Alaska and did that the farthest possible point within the borders of the United States of America. And this book and I were uh, invited to Alaska in January, uh, not the best time to go. Upon arrival, they, the people told me, they said, we've got great news for you. This University of, of Alaska in An Anchorage said, we've got great news for you. We think we're going to make it to zero while you're here. <laughs> There I met a woman who had made the farthest possible migration within the borders of the United States, which would be farther than many people coming from parts of, of other, from other continents to the United States. She migrated from Florida to Alaska, that's the farthest possible point, and based upon the circumstances of her life, she said that she felt she'd made the right decision for her life at that time. Now I want to say a couple things that just put this migration in perspective because of the inspiration that it can provide to all of us wherever we might happen to be. This great migration was the first time in our country's history that the lowest caste people signaled that they had options and were willing to take them. That had not happened in the in the uh, 246 years of enslavement, followed by another 100 years of uh, the Jim Crow uh, uh, caste system, this had not happened in the 12 centuries of enslavement. I want to, you know, to just sit with the idea that enslavement lasted for 12 generations. How many greats do you have to add to the word grandparent to begin to imagine how long enslavement lasted as an institution in this country uh, putting asunder so many families of people living under this for so long that they couldn't even imagine their great, great, great grandchildren being free. That's how long this lasted. So this great migration was the first time in this country's history that the lowest caste people signaled that they had options and were willing to take them. Secondly, this was the first time in our country's history that the lowest caste people actually had the chance to choose for themselves what they would do with their God-given talents and where they would pursue them. Think about it, in all those generations of enslavement followed by generations of Jim Crow a caste system, they had not had the chance to simply just to choose for themselves what was maybe their life's dream. What were they actually good at? And you know, you have to think about those rice plantations and those cotton fields and those sugar plantations and those tobacco fields. On those tobacco fields and on those rice plantations and cotton plantations and sugar plantations were opera singers, jazz musicians, playwrights, poets, 
novelists, surgeons, architects, journalists, professors, and how do we know that? We know that because that is what many of them, and more, more recently their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren now, have often chosen to become once they had the chance to choose for themselves what they would do with their God-given talents. And so you think about the lost potential for centuries in this country. But you also think about what was lost on the other side of that caste system, meaning the putative beneficiaries of the caste system were losing something too, losing something tr tremendously profound, perhaps even worse than those who were the targets of the, the caste system. And that's a spiritual loss, a spiritual loss, because if you're going to hold someone down in a ditch, you have to get into the ditch with them. And while you're holding someone down in the ditch, and while, the, while they're being held down in the ditch, neither of you can live up to your fullest potential. Imagine the tremendous loss of talent, creativity, intellect, and ingenuity that went for naught for generations in our country. Where might we be had all of the people in that region during that time, centuries, been able to live up to their truest potential? It's unfathomable and we can never go back to get it, but we hope that we can learn something from what was lost during that time. I want to share with you just one short story, one very quick story from this book, because if those of you who've read the book know that this is a book about the Great Migration writ large, but it's also really about people. It's three people primarily whose journey you follow. And interspersed are other stories, too, of other people who made this journey. And so uh, one of the people I want to share with you, one story I want to tell you is, is a very short one. And it involves our, our imagining ourselves um, in the state of Alabama. Uh, back in the 1920s, going far, far back in, in, in time. And to imagine ourselves as, uh, in a family, to observe this family of sharecroppers, a very large family, nine or ten children, and uh, they are working for the right to live on the land that they are farming. They're sharecroppers, so not being paid. Very hard, hard scrabble life. And they have this younger son, he's the, the, the baby of the family, and they are worried for what is going to become of him because he's very sickly, small boned. He does not have the, uh, the constitution for the hard life that they had all been born into as sharecroppers. And so they were very, very worried about him. Also, at around that time, this is the 1920s, there's this chatter and talk, quietly uh, talk, quiet people uh, speaking among themselves about what they are going to do in this caste system in which they find themselves. Because people have begun to leave. And they're all talking about, should they go? follow these other people who've left, or should they stay with the people that they love, their grandparents and aunts and uncles and their extended family? Should they go or should they stay? It's the question that every immigrant and migrant has to consider. And so there, there was this talk back and forth, should they go or should they stay? It's also important to note, as I mentioned to you, these migration streams, that because of where they were in Alabama, the place that everyone there was talking about was a city called Cleveland up in, in Ohio. They, these people had never been outside the county into which they'd been born, so they didn't, they'd never been there but they just had, that's what everyone was talking about. They were talking about it so much that the family had, the mother and the father had actually named that youngest sickly son Cleveland. Cleveland was his name. His name was James Cleveland. And so uh, the family were going back and forth about what to do. The mother and the father were debating this. The mother was convinced that they should go. The father was not so certain, so they went. <laughs> you know who's running that family. As they were beginning to pack their bags, the little boy, James Cleveland, began to notice that his father's hands were visibly shaking as they were packing. And it was then that he realized how very serious this was. The father was so nervous because he had never been outside of the county in, to, which, in, to which he had been born. He had heard that up in this place called Cleveland, Ohio, there was frozen ice that came out of the sky and landed in, 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 in mountains of, in hills of, of, of snow, which he'd never seen. He didn't know how he was going to manage in that world. What was, how was he going to take care of his family? So he was visibly nervous about leaving. But they make it on the train. They make the, their way north to Cleveland. And on the little boy's first day of school, the teacher asks him his name. It's a normal thing. It's expected. It's a new boy in school. And so he tells the teacher that his name is James Cleveland. But 
and, and actually, that it's actually JC, which is short for James Cleveland. But the teacher didn't understand him because she spoke in the ways that Northerners speak, and he was speaking in the way that Southerners speak. So she didn't understand what he said, so she started calling him Jesse. And that is how Jesse Owens got his name. If you learn nothing from today in my talk, you now know that Jesse Owens' name was not, never was Jesse. It's James Cleveland Owens. But the teacher didn't understand him, started calling him Jesse, and he went home to his parents. They started calling him Jesse, too. <laughs> Their attitude was, that must be what they do when you go north. They rename your children. And so that's how he got his name. Now, we know that he would go on to win a record number of gold medals at the Berlin Olympics, hosted by none other than the Nazis themselves, and overseen by none other than Hitler himself. And so we realized then that he was one of these people who was not fit for the field, as his parents had been worried. Track and field is what he was fit for. Track and field is what he was fit for. And he was one of the almost uncountable numbers of people who came out of this great migration and because of their abilities to be free to choose what they were meant to be, which was not in their, sadly not possible in the South at the time that they were growing up, would go on to become some of the best known people in 20th century history. Among them, of course, is Louis Armstrong, who was born here in New Orleans, migrated during part of the Great Migration up to Chicago, and was able to translate that talent into something that would make him one of the best known jazz musicians of his era. We also know that Mahalia Jackson was born here in New Orleans and migrated in 1927 also to Chicago. That was one of the ways. I actually must say that Louisiana is a very special place in so many, so many ways. It's also special in that it kind of, it's the one state that splits its migration stream. Almost everybody that, you, that I meet uh, in Louis, African American in Louisiana has, would have relatives both in Chicago and in Los Angeles. It was like they had a choice. And so the two of them went to, both Louis Armstrong and Mahalia Jackson, went to Chicago and were able to become world-renowned musicians as a result of the exposure that they got, being able to become recorded and to, to uh, establish themselves in a way that, sadly, in the Jim Crow era would not have been possible in the land of their birth. Music as a whole was, was transformed by this great migration because that was one of the things that, was, uh, that they were able to translate more, more easily. There's so many people who came out of this migration who would not have been known otherwise. Toni Morrison, for example, her parents were from Georgia and from Alabama. They migrated to, 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 to Ohio where she would get a chance to do something that we all take for granted now, but which would have been against the law at the time that she was growing up would have been growing up had they stayed, and that's just to go into a library and take out a library book. A lot of people are not aware that that was a hotly contested area of segregation during the time of the Great Migration. Merely by leaving, she, uh, she, her parents assured that she would get access to books. And if you're going to become a Nobel laureate, you know, it helps to get a book now and then. <laughs> you know, it helps. Um, uh, 20th century theater, the works of, uh, of Lorraine Hansberry, whose parents were from Alabama and Tennessee, they uh, migrated during different years to Chicago. And there, she's an example of one of the people who might not have existed had there been no great migration because their parents might not have met. They migrated to Chicago, worked very, very hard, and then they saved up to get a, a house that was in, uh, happened to be in a white neighborhood. Upon trying to move into the house that they had already purchased, uh, they were met with such violence that a brick narrowly hit, narrowly missed Lorraine Hansberry's uh, head uh, when she was seven years old. That's how virulent the resistance and hostility to African Americans, to these Southerners seeking freedom in the North, this is what they were met with. Her experiences uh, of trying to integrate uh, that neighborhood, of actually trying to move into the house that they had bought, inspired her to write one of the 20th century um, works of, of uh, 
of theater, A Raisin in the Sun, which is beloved by so many people. And then as, you know, back to music, Motown would not have existed if there had been no great migration, simply would not have existed. The founder, Barry Gordy, his parents were from Georgia. They migrated to Detroit, and once he got to be a grown man, he decided he wanted to go into music, but he didn't have the wherewithal to go all over the country looking for the best talent, and it turned out he didn't have to. There he was, surrounded by children of the great migration, children whose parents had come up from from the South, all parts of the South, carrying with them on their hearts and in their memories the music that had sustained the ancestors, the gospel music and the blues music and the spirituals that had sustained them. And so as they, as he was looking around and he saw all these, these kids who were, um, you know, who were growing up with this music, he saw these three girls. One was Mary Wilson, another one was Florence Ballard, and then there was a third one. <laughs> Diana Ross. We would not know Diana Ross's name had there been no great migration because for one thing she wouldn't have existed. Her mother was from Alabama, father from West Virginia, migrated to Detroit, different years, met, married, had her and her siblings and thus a legend was born. This Barry Gordy also heard about this very large family in Gary, Indiana. There were nine kids or so and the all of the Jackson family um, musicians and singers, we would not have known them at all had there been no great migration. They too were among the people whose parents met as a result of this great migration. And so this is the ways that this spread. Jazz, of course, is, is a creation of the great migration and New Orleans is such a tremendously central aspect of this gift to the world of jazz, which literally would not have existed had there not been this upwelling of creativity that came out of the South and got voice in the North during the Great Migration and then spread throughout the world and now circle back to where it began. And among those people uh, were Miles Davis, whose parents were from Arkansas, migrated to Illinois, and there he got the access to building on the talent that was within him all along, but could have gone fallow in the cotton country of Arkansas. Thelonious Monk, his parents were from New North Carolina, migrated to New York, where his mother worked cleaning office buildings, saved up for an upright piano, used upright piano, that she just hoped her son would one day learn to play. And John Coltrane, he migrated at the age of 16 right out of high school to Philadelphia, whereas upon arrival in Philadelphia that he got his first alto sax. And there are so many lovers of jazz who cannot imagine a world in which that man might not have gotten hold of a sax or if all of the people that I've described to you had not ever gotten a chance to be heard with the talent that they had. This is the nature of what was given to the world. These are gifts not just to the United States, but to the world and has had an impact. These are beloved figures throughout our planet. And so I want to close with a moment that was a part of this great migration and any migration. On whichever side of this moment you or your, you know, your ancestors might have been on. And that's the moment of departure. That's a moment when a, a family is about to change forever. A family is about to change forever because a young person, most migrations occur when people are in their teens and 20s. If you think back to your family genealogy, the family stories that you've heard, you will often find that whoever migrated from wherever they came from, even if it was from rural to city, that they often do it when they're on the cusp of life. And it's that moment of departure, which is the time that the young person who's made this decision to leave has got to say goodbye to the people who raised them. And there they are at a dock about to board a ship that's going to cross the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. Or there they are um, loading up a truck that's going to cross the Rio Grande. Or there they are at a bus depot or a railroad station about to board a bus or a train that's going to carry them across rivers and mountains to get from the south to some big city in the north or the west. And there with them, as they're at that, uh, at that dock or they're loading up the truck or at that railroad platform are the people who raised them. Their mother, their father, their aunt, their uncle, whomever it might have been who had gotten them to that point. And those older people were not going to be able to make the crossing with them. As they looked into the eyes of the people who raised them, there was no guarantee that they would ever see them alive again. I've heard this so many times to the people who made these crossings. No guarantee that they would ever set eyes again on the people who had raised them. I remember there was no Skype, no email, 
no texting, no cell phones, not even reliable long distance telephone service. And even if there had been, for many of the people that they were leaving, they didn't even have telephones. So this was going to be a complete break from all that they had known and all of the people that they loved. And the next time that they might hear anything about the people who raised them might be a telegram saying, your father has passed away or your mother is very, very ill. You must return home quickly if you are to see her alive again. That is the nature and magnitude of the sacrifice that had to have happened in all of our family backgrounds, wherever it was in our family tree, that made it possible for us to be here today. And I truly believe that they did not make that sacrifice only to find their descendants at odds and at, uh, at, at opposing one another in this new found place of what they hoped would be freedom. I truly believe that they hoped and prayed that life would be better for everyone in the place that they were arriving to. And so I believe that they've bequeathed us a beautiful burden, and that is to make their sacrifice mean something. And we have the power to do that in our individual lives, in our individual families, in our work toward whatever we believe is social justice in our world. And so I want to close with the words of Richard Wright, who left Mississippi the same year as Mahalia Jackson left New Orleans. And she, he left in 1927 at the migration age of 19. And he wrote these words as a whisper, as a prayer, as an encouragement to all of us here today to pursue and to dream and to believe what is possible, the things that are on our hearts that could actually come true. And he said, I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil, to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps, just perhaps, to bloom. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.